Isaiah. Yes. Hey, you forgot something. There's your NIV. <laughs> oh. <laughs> hey, very good. Luke chapter 4. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand your words. I do pray you'd help us to, as we go through a little preview of Isaiah, that um, that we might uh, be more curious to read through it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, uh, Luke four sixteen. And then we'll go to Isaiah. Okay, he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found a place where it was written, and then so forth. Okay, you can see that Isaiah is uh, spelled with an E in the New Testament, an I with the Old Testament, and that's because the King James translators were honest. It's no different than Peter and Pedro, or John or Juan or Ivan. Okay, it's the same word, it's just spelled differently, different language, going from uh, Hebrew to English, and this is from Greek to English. Okay, so the idea there is I want to show you that he's reading from, and it is called a book, so they did have it in a book form. And then he just opened it up, and he turned to a certain portion. They didn't have chapter and verse markings that I know of. In our Isaiah, that's uh, chapter 61 as he's reading. So the Lord gave credit to Isaiah for writing that portion of Scripture. Okay, now if you go back to the uh, book of Isaiah. Isaiah is a Bible inside the Bible. It is the largest book in the Bible with chapters. Okay, Psalms is, doesn't have chapters per se. It's Psalm 1, Psalm 2, Psalm 3, and so forth. It's not Psalm chapter 1. So Isaiah is the largest book in the Bible that has chapters, and it has 66 chapters to match 66 books in the Bible. So this is like an inside confirmation of the Bible that that's what we're supposed to have today, 66 books. Okay, now some, uh, the Catholics will add 13 other books, usually called the Apocrypha. Okay, but uh, in the Bible you have 66. Okay, now uh, if you would go to, uh, if you hold your finger in Isaiah, go to Luke 24. So how do we know 66 is right? Okay, many of these colleges and seminaries will say that even though we're Protestants, that we have had to rely on the Catholic Church in order to get our Bible, and that is not true. That's not true at all. Okay, the Jewish Bible, or what we could call the Jewish Bible, what we call the Old Testament, is uh, divided in three categories by Jesus in Luke 24, verse 44. And it says, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses. That's called Pentateuch. That's the first five. And in the prophets and in the Psalms, it's spelled with an S there. Psalms also is referred to as the writings concerning me. And then he says, then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So if you get a Jewish Bible in Hebrew. At one time I had a Jewish Bible that was translated to English. So it was just our Old Testament. I can't remember where I put it. I wish I could find it again. But uh, it wasn't King James Bible, but at least the idea what I liked about it is it showed me the same 39 books that we have, but they did put them in the order differently as the Jewish Bible is. Okay, but it is the same 39. And that's what an Orthodox Jew 
would refer to the scriptures, and Jesus would obviously agree with that. So that would be the 39 in the Old Testament. So how do we know the 27 in the New Testament? Why don't we include the epistle of Barnabas and the shepherd of Hermes? Okay, that's a funny name, but that's, that's two apocryphal New Testament books. Or the epistle of Thomas. That's another one I've heard about. Uh, can't think of any others off the top of my head. Uh, the book of Enoch, that's Old Testament. Okay, or at least under that time period. Okay, so we go to Isaiah, and we discover that Isaiah is a Bible inside the Bible. So Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. Paralleling Genesis 1, verse 1, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. So if you would go to Isaiah chapter 6. Okay, chapter 6, the number 6 is a number for man. The sixth book in the Bible is the first book named after a man. The man has six letters in his name, Joshua. Joshua is the Hebrew Old Testament equivalent of the name Jesus in the New Testament. Okay, so Joshua is going from Hebrew to English. Jesus is going from Greek to English. Okay, and then Jacob, or commonly known as the Jacobites. Jacob is the Old Testament equivalent of the New Testament, James. So, in King James Bible, it could be King Jacob Bible, and Jacob is Israel. Okay, so those are those words. Now, chapter 6, the first book, or the sixth book of the Old Testament is Joshua, and that is the Lord is salvation. His name means that. And on Isaiah 6, verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. So, in chapter 6, he saw the Lord. In the sixth book in the Old Testament was Joshua, the Lord, picture of the Lord. Okay, now if you try Isaiah chapter 40. Now, any of the scholars or college professors, they see as they read through Isaiah that there is such a, a, a difference or a break between Isaiah chapter 39 and 40 that they've come up with a what's called a Deutero Isaiah. Now, isn't that impressive, Deutero? I could write that in sloppy handwriting and call it MD, medical doctor. Okay, a Deutero. What's that duet? It's just the second Isaiah. That's all that they're trying to say. So they, the scholars say that Isaiah has two different men named Isaiah and a Deutero Isaiah. And the first Isaiah wrote Isaiah 1 through 39, and the second Isaiah wrote 40 to 40, uh, 66. But no, Jesus gave credit to Isaiah for Isaiah 61. Okay, so, no, in the Bible, Isaiah, he gets credit for the whole thing. Now, in chapter 40, verse 3, again, there's a break there. And is there not a break in our Bible? The 39th book and the 40th? The 39th is Malachi, and the 40th is Matthew. And in Matthew chapter 3, a guy named, shows up named John the Baptist. And here we have a prophecy of John the Baptist in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Aren't those verse markings kind of interesting? You know, as Stephanus tried to do those on his horse when he was riding through the woods, you know, and going horse. That's what the scholars jokingly about. There's this guy named Stephanus. Chapter 40, verse 3, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That, the first one that fulfilled that was John the Baptist. And the other is going to be Elijah. Okay, then chapter 66, verse 22. Isaiah 66, verse 22, we have Isaiah writing about the new heavens and the new earth. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, and so forth and so on. And where do we find that in our Bible? In the 66th book, Revelation, in chapter 21 and 22. 
So this, uh, in my mind, is a confirmation that Isaiah is a Bible inside the Bible. And what is he writing to about in Isaiah? What is the entire book about? Who is it addressed to? Now, there are some portions in the Bible that are addressed specifically to Jewish people. There are some portions specifically to Gentiles. There are some portions specifically addressed to women. There are some addressed to men or husbands. Okay, and the ones that's addressed to the husbands... That's for him to make sure he follows. And the one that's addressed to the wives, that's not for him to make sure she follows. That's her choice. Okay? She's not going to rail on him to do the first one. But why is it that men always pick on that one? Okay? But even at that... Isaiah is a Bible inside the Bible that's addressed to everybody. Okay, lost man, saved man, righteous men, wicked men. Everybody's held accountable for Isaiah. Isaiah 1 verse 1. And what is he writing about? What is, it, what is the subject of the entire book of Isaiah? Verse 1, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So he's writing about the state, the Jewish state, Judah, and the city, Jerusalem. That's the subject. That's what Isaiah is writing about. And he's writing about during the time period of Uzziah, Joseph, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And then he says, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken, and so forth. So he wants everybody on this earth to know about Jerusalem and Judah, and that is why world history revolves around them. Disprove the Bible. That's all they got to do. Let's change it. Make it Brussels, Belgium. That's where the beast is, the big computer system in Brussels, Belgium. That's probably where the economic central system will be run during the tribulation time period. Brussels, Belgium, Catholic-controlled area. Okay, let's change it. How about changing it to uh, Geneva, where CERN is located? You know, where they're trying to, you know, split the gene and all this stuff and try to go through space. You know, they're trying to split the universe or something like that. Why, why, why don't we be like, oh, it's, it's got to be America. Oh, we Americans think everything revolves around America, so it's got to be America. No, it's Jerusalem. And that proves God is in control. God's in charge. Okay? A country, Judah or Israel, the nation of Israel, is not one-fourth the size of Indiana, and world politics goes through there. Why? Because God is interested in that place. And the first time the word holy is found in the Bible is in that, it's about that place. So that's what he's writing about. If you would look in Isaiah 34, he had another idea he wanted us to know. Isaiah 34, he wants everybody to know this. And and I'll bet you uh, 90% of Christians don't know this. And God wants the whole world to know this. I didn't know this when I, after going through five years of Christian college. I didn't know this. Isaiah 34, he says, Come near, ye nations, to hear and hearken, ye people. Let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth. And then the rest of the chapter, what is it? His indignation, God's mad. What's he mad about? Verse 2, for the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. And you keep reading down. The area he's writing about is in verse 5, Idumea, or Idumea. Okay, that is modern-day Saudi Arabia. Modern-day Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia gets a pass from our government. I doubt, he, I, I'm... Guaranteed they violate human rights. Guaranteed. So does China. Guaranteed violation of human rights. Why do, why do those two get a pass? It's the money. It's the money. Uh, yesterday we went up, saw my sister Janet and her kids, and Josh, 
who really knew nothing about America, pretty much so. He grew up in China. He can uh, read and speak and write the Chinese language. And so he's telling us some of the things that goes on in China. And I, I said, are you serious? You know? And it's just bizarre what they do. You know, one restaurant has three squeak mice. Sounds very appetizing. Small mice before they get the hair. And it squeaks when you pick it up. It squeaks when you dip it. It squeaks when you eat it. Well, ain't that yuck? And I won't talk about the other one that he's talked about. It's bad. It's really bad. You know, of course, dog. You know, eating dog. <laughs> but uh, that culture is amazing. And I don't know anything about China. You know, and that's a culture that um, they'll just block everything out. We don't know anything about Tiananmen Square, really, per se, where army tanks just came right in and rolled over people who had no guns, no weapons, nothing. And then they just wipe it out and nobody says anything about it. That's a culture that's humanism. Okay, but yet, I remember years ago, Hillary bragging about China. Man, if she liked it so much, I'd give her a one-way trip. She would not have her woman's rights there, not like here. They think China is so great, Saudi Arabia is so great. Saudi Arabia stinks. Don't have a Baptist church, a Methodist church, Lutheran church, anywhere. They get a free pass. After 911, all the planes were grounded except for one. And all the Saudi, the Saudi Arabian sheiks got out of our country because the Bushes let them out. You know, all that stuff. Saudi Arabia and south of the Dead Sea, what's the Dead Sea today, and south in the Saudi Arabia, Isaiah 34 says, what's going to happen is hell from beneath of us is going to start bubbling up like a volcano and that's going to actually turn into a literal lake of fire where people will actually see it during the millennial time period. And if somebody uh, meets the qualifications of the death sentence, they will be da in danger of being thrown bodily into that lake by the order of Jesus Christ. And how many Christians know that? They don't know that. And Isaiah 34, God wants everybody to know that. God is going to defend Israel. And that's his political foreign policy. That's the way it's going to be. And nothing's going to change it. Isaiah 34, this is what God wants everybody to know. Now, if you go through Isaiah, remember that these prophets were, they were dual type prophets in that they first tried to get people right spiritually and then second, politically. Now, that's not our calling in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, because they're religious structure and the politics were one and the same as far as the commonwealth of Israel, the prophets usually would aim at them religiously first, but at the same time they would bring up political issues because they were one and the same. Now, what was a, what was a, a, a national sin of Judah? The national sin is found in chapter 5, verse 24. <clears throat> okay, the national number one sin of Judah was a rejection of the words of God. Okay, I, if you watched the uh, proceedings last Friday, you had a, all these different religious structures. I did hear Jesus' name several times. That was a blessing. But unfortunately, nobody read from a Bible, not a pure Bible. They read from some tainted thing. But I, I guess that's better than nothing. <laughs> but in the seminaries and in the Christian colleges where everything is where God's looking at, they have rejected the words of God. The King James Bible in particular. Isaiah 5, 24 says, Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossoms shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law 
of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. That was the national sin, and that's the national sin in America, and that has not changed. The King James Bible is despised in the Christian colleges and seminaries all across this country. And even though people may be more conservative, people may be more optimistic because Donald Trump's in office, where obviously much better than the alternative. But until this country gets back to that book, there's nobody in the White House that's going to fix anything, spiritually speaking. So it's the word. It's the word. Now, you can write to schools and find out for yourself, but if D.L. Moody came back today and walked the halls of Moody Bible Institute, he would boot out about 95% of them people. He'd boot out all of the professors. Why? Because they've rejected the words of God. They've gone to all these perversions. Now, as that is a spiritual, that's a spiritual sin, what is the national sin or uh, evidences of the spiritual sin. Okay, Isaiah chapter 1, so we're going to run through some of them. These are national um, rotten fruit of a nation that has rejected the words of God. Isaiah 1 verse uh, 2, verse no, verse 3. The ox knoweth his owner and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not no, my people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel on anger. They are gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken anymore? Ye would revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the heart is faint. They're sick in the head. It's a national health care crisis. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment, and your country is desolate, and so forth. And the one reason why God uh, allows a national health care crisis, which we do have in our country, is because you reap what you sow. And if you're going to eat garbage, you're going to die from the garbage. And this is why in cultures where they eat bats and all these stuff, their, li- their, na- their lifespan is like 40 years old. You know, you get 20 and you're over the hill. These cultures. Okay, and so this is this the physical sickness is God trying to wake somebody up. He will destroy the body in order to save the soul. Okay, I mean that's the intent. And some people won't they won't even consider God until they are sick as a dog. And then they might consider God. So that is an outward evidence of a nation that's rejected God. Chapter 5, verse 8 is another outward evidence. Okay, chapter 5, verse 8. This this might shock some folks. But it says, Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. Okay, house to house. What's that? That's cities. The first man in the Bible to build a city was Cain. You know, whenever I drive up to Chicago, I drive through there, and I'm say, I always say, boy, I'm glad I don't live here. Okay, and you can see that these last few elections, the split is between city and country. That's where the split is. Okay, people say liberal and conservative. It's more Country and city. The city is taking, and the country folks are raising the food. And that's where the split is. Okay, it's the city life. It's the nightlife in the cities. That's where sin abounds. 
Okay, and so chapter 5, verse 8, the Lord, you know, there's a common saying that fences make good neighbors. When Obama gets his house, when he comes back to the civilian, or he's in the civilian life, I guarantee he's going to put a fence around his property. If it's not there already, I guarantee it. Fences make good neighbors. Okay, and they're griping about all this fence between, about Mexico. Yeah, put the thing up. But make sure somebody don't jump over it. Okay, and the thing is, is these people, they're not, you know, they, they don't, you know, oh, just come into our, they won't let people come into their house if they don't want to come into their house. And a nation is just nothing more than that. So in verse 8, it's country life versus city life. Uh, life. Chapter 5, verse 11, uh, the tax of this is called sin tax. 5 verse 11, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. Drunkenness. America is a drunken society. It's either drunk on liquid or drunk on chemicals. It's still drunkenness. Be it a medication, it's drunkenness. Beer, liquor, alcohol is a depressant. They say it's a depressant. And the liquor and any taxes that's placed on liquor and cigarettes, it's always called sin tax because they know what it is. And this is how they buy the congressmen off and everything. So a society that's based on that is a society that's rejected the words of God. Chapter 5, verse 20, another national sin. This is the established religion of the public school system. It is a religion. Woe to them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That is called situation ethics. Okay, that is a doctrine of secular humanism. I can remember these things in school. If you have so many people in a boat and somebody doesn't have the blah, 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 who should die? <laughs> You know, it's like, uh, you know, there's an airplane was going down, <clears throat> and there's a young kid in the airplane, you know, and a lawyer's in the airplane, and a genius in the airplane, and they had two parachutes. And they're trying to decide who's going to get the parachutes. And, a genius, and, and the, the lawyer said, well, I, you know, I can help a lot of people. So he grabbed a parachute and jumped out. You know, and then the genius grabs one, he jumped out. And the little kid grabbed his parachute. The genius grabbed his backpack. That's what he grabbed. <laughs> Let him jump out. Okay, and so uh, situational ethics. When is it right to kill so, such and such at such and such time? You know, the situation determines the ethics. Okay, and that's secular humanism. That's pragmatism. That's when every man does that which is right in her own eyes. That's our culture. That's a public school system. There's no right and wrongs. There's no morality. You see, we came from an animal, so just act like an animal. And when the kid does, then they reprimand him. Well, I'm just doing what you told me to do. Okay, and so this is a, this is a situational ethic. That's a religion. The evolutionary theory is a religion. Okay, and, and it's based on faith. I got the one track back there. It's called the religion of evolution. Oh, they hate that when you say that. But I've quoted several evolutionary professors that said it's a religion. It's a faith. So I quoted their preachers and said it's a faith. And that's America. Chapter 5, verse 21. What have they exalted? One of them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Worldly education. Do you know why Ruckman is hated so much? He's hated so much because he has the education and more of the seminarians, and he still believes the book is the word of God. He's not supposed to believe that. I was just talking to Jerry uh, Robertson this morning, a fellow at the other church, and he's, he's a seed corn salesman. He's a graduate of Purdue. And he's had, he said he's had like two or three people lately that, Jerry, you went to Purdue and you believe in creation? 
Yeah. Yeah. He's not supposed to. Brett Bishop is not supposed to be a Bible believer. He went through four-year school, master's. He's got to earn doctorate from Purdue, I think in biology. Is it biology? He's not supposed to be a creationist. <laughs> but he sees the science aspect, which verifies creation. Why? Because he's honest. And that's a blessing to have, something to know, have somebody like that and know somebody like that. Very sincere. These are national sins, and you can see some more. Now, there are some major topics in Isaiah. Uh, chapter 6 is a vision of God. In chapter 6, verse 3, it's one of two times in the Bible where it says, Holy, 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 reference to the Godhead. That's chapter 6. So you have a, a vision of God where Isaiah saw the Lord. And in chapter 14, he has a vision of Satan. So he has a vision of God. And in chapter 14, he has a vision of Lucifer. Chapter 14, 12. So you got the opposite, the extremes there. Lucifer, that's the only, find that's the only time that's found in the Bible. All the new Bibles take it out, put something else in, day star or morning star. So you have a, a picture of God or vision of God, a vision of Lucifer. And then in chapter 28, Paul or uh, Isaiah encouraged people to personally study the Bible. And he said, here is how you learn the words of God. Isaiah 28, verse 9 and 10. How do we learn the Bible, the Word of God? Whom shall I teach knowledge? Whom shall I make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here little, there low. Sounds like it takes some work. That's how you learn the Bible. In the next chapter, he has the two basic excuses of why people will not read the Bible. Isaiah 29, verse 10. <clears throat> For the Lord hath poured upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets, your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. The vision of all has become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying. So he gives uh, an educated man... A book, the Bible, and it says, read it. And the guy says, he says, read this, I pray thee. And his, he saith, here's his excuse, I cannot for it's sealed. Got many interpretations. It's mystic. It's mystical. It's religious. I can't get it. Everybody has their own opinion. Okay, that's the cop out from the educated crowd. Okay, from the redneck down in Alabama or Arkansas is in chapter 29, verse 12. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, <coughs> he spits out some taw. He said, I, I don't have any book learning. Okay, I'm not learning. So you got the extremes there of why they're not reading the Bible. They're both excuses. So Isaiah throws that out there. And then Isaiah got some direct words from God, chapter 40 to 48. If you want to find a crash course to read about God himself, this is God talking about himself. This is God challenging mankind as a body of people to a debate. And he says, I want to see you create something out of nothing like I can do. And I want to see you predict a future in detail and allow it to come to pass like I can do. Let's see you do it. You're so big. And God says, you're nothing. You're worthless. You're nothing but a drop in a bucket compared to me. And that's the God of the Bible. Okay? And that's the God we want to worship and honor. And then in chapter 53, the chapter that's forbidden to be read in Israel. The rabbis do not want people in Israel to read chapter 53. That's the portion in Isaiah that the Ethiopian eunuch was reading as he's sitting in his chariot, reading it out loud, Isaiah 53, he's reading about a four-legged animal, lamb, but he realized it's not 
an animal, it's a man. That's a man. Who is that? And he's just scratching his afro, trying to figure it out. Is that, what is that, what is that, what would that be? I don't know what that would be. And then the Spirit of God says, Philip, you go over there and you talk to that man. And he ran over there and he heard him reading. And he says, you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I, some, some man guide me. And he jumps in that chariot, and then he starts explaining to him about Jesus Christ. And that guy got saved. But a Jewish man's not allowed to read Isaiah 53. Why? It's because they, they cop out, and a rabbi says that that's written about Israel. And anybody who reads it knows it's not written about Israel. And so if a Jewish person reads it and he said, how can that be Israel, Rabbi? And he will say, you just shut up and listen to what we got to say. Why? Because they're blinded to Jesus. Isaiah 53, that's the chapter. If, if you have an opportunity to talk to a Jew, that's the chapter you want to take him to. That one or Psalm 22, two are the, the, those two are the best to describe the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the Savior of the world right there. And Isaiah writes about him. Chapter 53. So those are some of the major topics of Isaiah and some of the national sins of Judah. And then we could look at our country and see where we're at. And the only hope that we have in our country is not in a politician, but it's found in that book right there. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray and ask that you'd help us to be uh, people that uh, seek after your words and help us to seek after the blessed words that you've given us and ask the Spirit of God to be our teacher and guide. In Jesus' name, amen.